And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a returning good brother to the temple. He is the elite... Should I use the... I'm not. No, I'm not going to use the Latin X that I have dignity. He is the leading Hispanic voice <laughs> in sci in science fiction, the cr and the creator of Ro of Robo Toad Wrecked Manlet and the upcoming creator of Deus Volt, the one and only John Della Rose. How are you doing tonight, man? I am happy. Everything's going great. <laughs> very good. Very good. Very good. So um. Now the t now. In the p a lot of the stuff that I've s now you've dipped into fantasy in the past, but um, I believe the last time you dipped into fantasy it was primarily steam primarily in the steampunk end of things, and with something like Deus Vold, you're going full on you're going full on eighties style cheese, and um, what I'm curious about on that is. What were some what were some of the fantasy comics that you that you kind of cut your teeth on? Comic wise, I probably haven't uh, read a lot. I mean, I've read I've read a bunch of the Conan stuff, and that's obviously where we drew a big influence from. Mm -hmm. uh, I've I've looked at a little bit of, of Prince Valiant. Um, I I've, I read Elfquest when I was a kid too. I guess I I guess I should mention that that counts. Uh, yeah, and I, and this probably has some vibes uh, on that level from uh, the Elfquest story storylines also. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, for the most part, my fantasy reading was uh, an interest was in novels. I was a very very big uh, Robert Jordan fan growing up, so I, I was I was I've read The Wheel of Time like mm -hmm. three times, which doesn't sound like a tremendous amount, but with the amount of words that are in that storyline, three times is a pretty pretty big undertaking. Honestly, that may that may be two times too many. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I've got nothing. I've got nothing against. Ro I've got nothing against Robert Jordan, but he. Ha but he had a he had a bad habit of get of getting lost in his own ideas because, like in in a lot of fantasy works, you eventually have a um a net a network of characters. But it's. About five books in with Robert Jordan's work, that becomes a tumbleweed. <laughs> oh, it's it, it's really really rough to read between books. I'd say especially seven through eleven. Uh, if you can get past that chunk, uh, you're in a good spot, ready to go. But uh, but that's tough. Now, of course, of course, I do have to address the elephant in the room: the fact that the final two books were not um, were not written by um, Jordan. They were they were fi they were finished up by um, Brandon Sanderson. Yes, which I was glad they were. I thought he he really drove the pacing along and brought the story back mm -hmm. uh, from where it was meandering and just focused everything. Yeah. Thank God, I, it, was, it was excellent at that point, and I, I was very happy with the ending. Yeah, um, I do. I um, I do not to, about a about a couple years ago. I had Stephen S. Long on, and he talked about his experience um going through the wheel of time books when he was doing when he was writing um wheel of time d20 he did not enjoy the experience largely because he he described it as um long stretches of not a whole lot of ha not a whole lot of things happening and um there are, there are points to that but when stuff does happen it's really awesome to kind of balance that out oh yeah and I will. I will. I am not too proud to admit that my introduction to the Wheel of Time was through Blind Guardian. The same, the same way that they were my introduction to look to um, the Cimmerillion. Uh, interesting. Uh, yeah, but for those who are, are, are looking at Dave's Volt, mm -hmm. my writing style is in, in no way uh, even close to Robert Jordan. I'm. I'm like. Fast-paced, breakneck. There is always something happening, just because I, I have a short attention span for the most part. I don't know how I've gotten through that three times, uh, but uh, but yeah, you can just expect wall-to-wall -wall action from minute one. That's that's all I do. I'd say I'd say it's also I'd say when it 
I think saying that it that it's a short attention span is is not giving you enough credit because it's, there's an understanding that you have you do not have infinite amount of pa amount of pages and pacing. Like you've got you've got a certain amount you've got a certain amount of of time that you that you can utilize and that time is at a premium. So uh, so so you've got to use as much of it as you can, and you're and obviously you there's no way you could get away with a 200 page 200 page um comic out of the gate. <laughs> no, got to got to slow roll it and uh, and get people interested in the story uh, pretty quickly. And you know, I mean, 66 pages, which is what we've done, is you know take takes a part time artist 60 90 days of work. So it's you know it's it's maybe more. Uh, so you know by the time you get uh, this rolling is really a half a year project uh, to get done, uh, even at this level. Now, of course, I'd love to continue this forever and 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 have this be a, uh, a a series that you know spans thousands of books or whatever. But you know, we'll, we'll take it one step at a time. And the and the first job for me is just to entertain you guys within sixty six pages. Make sure you get a full complete story and uh, and have fun in the process. Mm -hmm. Now. When it now when it now when it came to the when it came to the idea of do, of doing this doing this approach, um, what would what would you say was the spark that kicked off the idea of doing um, Deus Volt? Was this something that you had been kicking around for a while, or was the inspiration a little bit more recent? Um, I'd been toying around with doing like Crusader themes for a while. I've got my science fiction trilogy, which is kind of Crusaders in space. And so I looked at that, and I'm like, that you know, that that that's something I'd kind of be interested in doing for a comic at some point, probably. Uh, maybe maybe do something in that world. Uh, but then I thought about it, and I'm like, okay, well, I already have that. So if I'm going to do something different, uh, well, why not try my hand at fantasy with it and and see how that goes? So uh, yeah, I've been kicking it around for a while. I've been kicking around a secondary uh, thing, which I'm calling Desu Volt, which is uh, Desu's a a weeb term, if you guys don't are familiar <laughs> with it, but uh, but it, which is just a, a manga sort of uh, uh, sort of silly version of this. But uh, the, those those two things have just been percolating in my head for a long time. And you know, it, 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 when I found the right artist for this, I was like, you know what, this is my this is my Crusader Conan guy, and so we'll we'll head that direction, do something cool with it. Although, and I I may have asked this previously, and, and it's just slip it's just slipped my mind. But what what what's the appeal to you when it comes to Crusaders? Just from just from a storytelling perspective, I I like knights. I like the whole medieval thing uh, and the the Crusades. There's a uh, you know there there's this like foreign travel element to it. There's this uh, the spanning spanning almost all of the world at least at the time element to it. So it's, it's really grand in scope. Um, and I like the idea of having a holy cause, uh, where, where you're going off and doing something, uh, on behalf of God too. I think that's a very, a very, uh, noble concept. And when I want to get back to like heroism and, and I, and a lot of what I do is trying to push like good is good. Evil is evil. Uh, because we, we've really kind of lost that and muddied that over the last 20, 30 years of, uh, of our culture. Mm -hmm. Um, it, having, having a noble quest from God is about as as good you, as you can possibly get. So it makes sense thematically, uh, and it's got a cool aesthetic to it, which you know the, the two combined is awesome. Everybody, everybody is everybody's familiar in one form or another with the um, with the bucket helm, as it's as it's been nicknamed over the years. When it to the point where that's become the source of the meme. Or, oh, true. Or, Especially, especially with people saying, th saying, th saying um, things like, "You're talking some mad shit for somebody in crusading distance." <laughs> yeah. Um. So yeah, the memes there too, and I've enjoyed the memes over the years also, and and definitely that that had an influence on it. Um, you know, unfortunately, if I would have come out with that maybe two years ago, the meme would have been a little more fresh in people's heads. Uh, but uh, I I think I did uh, I think I did that whole genre justice. Uh, and uh, you know, meme or not, at this point, I, I've kind of got my own thing with it. Yeah. And 
when it com- now when it comes to when it com- when it comes to the approach that we're do that we're doing with um, this. So if I'm not mistaken, with Deus Vold, you have a Sp- a Spanish knight and crusader um, go- going on a going on a se- going on a um, quest after see after seeing a vision of the Holy Grail. Um, wh- when now when it comes now when it comes to the whole idea of a- of someone going into an into a very alien landscape, um. What was the reasoning for t- for taking that approach instead of instead of setting it on a slightly modified Earth? Um, uh, the, a couple. I drew a couple inspirations for that. One is, of course, John Carter, mm-hmm. where uh, you know it's a Confederate soldier who r- runs off and disappears into Mars, right? Yeah. So the same sort of concept there. He's you know this is he's disappearing into a fantasy world as a crusader. Uh, the other one is also uh, Paul Anderson's The High Crusade, where Crusaders got picked up by aliens and um, and uh, ended up in in fighting for their lives in this other world. Also, so both of those are are, are some classics which I absolutely love, and I I like that idea. I didn't really want to go sci-fi with it again because I, I've kind of already done that with the Crusader mm-hmm. theme, so I wanted to push a fantasy uh, version with that. And of course, then the third obvious uh, comparison for that is. Uh, uh, the Chronicles of Narnia with the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, where uh, you know the kids kind of run through this you know World War situation where they're they're getting bombed and they show up in uh, in a fantasy world, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, so all the all those kind of percolated in there, and we really tried to draw as much influence from those old pulps and the old classic fantasy stories as possible. Yep. And give now when it now uh, given the fi- given the the John Car- the John Carter comparison is especially interesting to me because obviously with the cover we ha- we have um, we have fl- we have flying cr- we have flying creatures in the in the background and what I'm cu- what I'm curious ab- what I'm curious about is the is the style of fantasy that this other this other world the the um Kit- the Kitian I believe I got that pronounced right is are we are we dealing are we dealing with um with the kind of with the kind of tech um alternate technology that we saw that we saw in Barsoom or are we dealing with something that's a little bit more contemporary when it comes to their level of tech And okay. I'm sorry, I was muted. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering um, about that. Yeah, I was like, I had this nice answer, and now it's gone. Um, so yeah, it's it's just high fantasy. Mm-hmm. So so you've got you know the the horses and and bows and arrows and swords. Uh, so so he moves from a medieval real experience to just medieval fantasy world. Uh, nothing with any any sort of tech or anything like that. All right. And I'm ge- now given that, given that, given that, um, one of the other th- one of the other things that I that I'm a, I'm a bit curious on, especially given the pr- given the um, preview pages, is that there's we there's almost a there's almost a um, strip or a nine or a uh, three by three approach when it comes to the panels. Was that intentional, or did or did it just um, happen to fall into that approach? We tried to lay out our panels like you would find in a uh, you know sixties or seventies uh, Marvel comic. So we we dialed back the panel layouts from from things just to give it more of that classic feel and look. Uh, all right, and when it comes, I know we I know we talked about it being traditional fantasy, but I'm but would it be would it fair be fair of me to assume that a lot of the um, non-human or demi-human races in the in this particular story aren't the typical aren't the typical fantasy races that you'd that you'd see in what I've called the Tolkien melting pot. Not at all. I wanted to veer away from that uh, as much as possible. Now I am doing a novel series where we've got the the traditional high fantasy elves and um, dwarves. Uh, in it uh and that'll be coming out later this year yeah. but uh 
but for this, I, I really wanted it to be special and different. I wanted it to have that feeling where, where when you opened up Narnia, you didn't know what you were going to expect uh, mm-hmm. to find or, or Wizard of Oz or any of the old, the old stuff. So that's why we added our, our strange kitten cat people race. And uh, there's there's like a, a some frog toady creatures. Uh, there's uh, there's there's the um, the gorillas with wings, which, you know, plays back to Wizard of Oz a little bit, but but a little different. They had monkeys with wings. We went, mm. we went full gorilla. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and then there's, uh, some other demonic creatures also. So, um, there, there's a, there's, there's a lot of different things. And, and I didn't, I didn't want to veer into just the generic high fantasy because yeah. I, I thought we could uh, flex our creative muscles a little more than that. Now, when it comes to the creatures that look, that have the appearance of demons, would they, would, is that as far as it goes with, with them or, or, or as far as far as the narrative is concerned, they are demons. They are demons, hundred percent. Yes. And of course, by that, by that, I mean they're um, they're outsiders to the to the realm, the same way that um, certain demons in say D anD D have the outsider template. Correct. Yes. Um, yes, I've I've developed a whole system for the world building. Which is going to get interesting. You, you only it's it's only mentioned in passing mm-hmm. because all that's seen in this book is uh, is of course our sort of medieval times where the crusader goes and disappears through this, and then uh, this little realm of the Kitian, which is which is being you know harassed by this this demon lord, and um, but in passing I mentioned that there's there's like seven uh, different major realms. Uh, and so that's, that's how I built this world, uh, because, uh, I, I looked at it through Christian theology mm-hmm. and of course the the number seven is very important with creation with God. Uh, it's just, it pops up everywhere. So I thought, okay, so how would I layer these different seven worlds? Uh, and I did this before ever scripting any of this, just so it's there. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I just came up with it and I put earth kind of as, as kind of one of those middle levels before you ascend up into heaven. And then of course there's hell at the very bottom. And then there's a lot of in between, and so all the in betweens what we're going to explore uh, here. Well, we're exploring one of the realms here, but uh, you know, uh, I guess it's probably no secret at this point that there we're, we're going to do another one. Uh, but we're going to explore these different realms, uh, you know, as as uh, as we as we get to different stories, uh, and that'll that'll provide some of the fun. Given that, when, within the book, are you planning on putting some sort of um, some sort of excerpt in, say, the back pages? Just going over certain aspects with the with the world. Um, that's part of the stretch goals and all that. So it's like uh, I've got a, a short prose story to write now because we got a, a stretch goal added to that uh, from our list, and that short prose story is going to go into the background of the kind of the kitten a little bit more, but then you can go into an, in a comic form like this. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've got character bios that are going to come up, which will kind of uh, lean into that a little more. Uh, I w- you know when hopefully we get to those points uh, in the, in the, in the deal. Uh, and then after that, uh, we have, uh, I, I, we're going to drop a fantasy map so you can kind of look at it. Um, so I'm only going to explore this realm in this book. Um, so that way it's, it feels complete. You know, I mean, if we don't get further than this, uh, wh- which we're going to, I mean, but, uh, but that way people just really get a complete product. And, uh, and then this, this, this really just focuses on this one realm. But yes, there's a lot of lot of back uh, explore, explorational stuff that I'd, I'd love to add to this mm-hmm. uh, if we can get there. And when now, when it comes to when it, given that you given that you mentioned um, John Carter, and I've I have and apologies for har- for harping on this, but it's but sometimes sometimes that's how it goes. Um. Now, of course, with with Carter, he ha- he had extra normal abilities due to the fact that uh, Mars has a lower gr- Mars has a lower gravity, which is why he was able to why he was able to jump jump ridiculously far and basically be the Superman before Superman. Because yes, well, John Carter has inspired a lot of people over the years. That's why that's why I said that an attempt to try and do a movie in the twenty first century was do- was doomed from the start when everybody has ripped off John Carter in one form or another. Right. Mm-hmm. Um. But I'm ge- I'm guessing that Sir Do- that Sir Domingo doesn't ha- doesn't have any effect on him in this new world. It's just, it, he he's just he's has just the same properties that he would have had on Earth. 
Correct. He's just like a, a Conan style hero more than a John Carter style hero to where he's he's just got his sword. He's just got his uh, his sort of court coat of honor mm-hmm. and he, he's going to do what he's going to do. Uh, and of course, uh, the only real difference in this world, um, just like, you know, from a physical standpoint is, is just the use of magic exists. Yeah. So now when it comes to, and obviously, obviously, um, Conan had a, had a distrust of magic, but does that, does that apply with, with Domingo as well? That he, that he has a, a degree of, a degree of distrust when it comes to, the, when it comes to these supernatural elements within this new world, absolutely, uh, he views them as demonic uh, because uh, you know that's uh, the magic, witchcraft, sorcery is uh, very, very uh, uh, negative in the Christian faith. So he's he's coming at it from that perspective. Yeah, but um, um, the other the other thing that's it's interesting that you bring up that you bring up a code of honor when when. It, with um Conan in the same discussion because a lot a lot of people can a lot of people kind of miss that when it com- miss that when it comes to co- when it comes to Conan like even even with ha- even with how hardened he is he's not he he's never been fully heartless Certainly never was- no he, he might he might do some thieving to to make some money mm-hmm. he might he might raid places he he likes to to uh, you know, he'll he'll kill anybody who gets in his path. He's a problem. But if you look, he's always he's always uh, like you know he's always defending the damsel in distress as much as he possibly can. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's always uh, he's always seeming to like you know free slaves when he can. He's always you know there there's just there's little things where he is a hero. He's not he is he's truly a hero. Uh, no matter no matter uh, you know what what his uh, I guess more basic instincts are. And uh, you know, sometimes he can give himself into debauchery a little bit. Uh, you know, he's gonna he's gonna do the right thing at the end of the day. And when it comes, to, I'd say I'd say when it comes to even that debauchery, it's more of he's a product of his environment because hyper because Hyperborea is a god awful place to live. <laughs> yes, and absolutely it, true. It, it, ver- it very much is the it very much is your. You're either you're either strong or you're dead or enslaved. Yes. <laughs> and well, he, well, for for him, it's a case of I might I might die tomorrow, so I may as I may as well live I may as well live it up right now. Um. Especially, especially, I and I'd and in that same vein, I'd say the other thing that's misunderstood is um, the whole thing with Crom. Because even yes. though, even though even though Krom is his god, it's it's, and this is something I've had to explain to people who've only seen Conan through the film. Nobody, pr- none of the Sumerians pray to Krom. Krom's name is used more like an expletive. Uh, yes, uh, that's exactly the case, uh, and you can tell he's. I mean, Conan's never very a religious source. If anything. The gods in 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 the, those realms are are things to be feared, like demons almost. They're they're scary things. Now that's where we're going to differ in Deus Volt, obviously, where where uh, our hero definitely is is praying. He's definitely uh, you know uh, trying to do what he believes uh, God wants him to do, and he's he's hyper religious. Uh, so so that's a big difference between uh, I'd say Domingo in our books and Conan in uh, in in that. Uh, would you in, say in, that? Would you say that personality-wise, he has more in common with Solomon Kane than Conan? In some ways, yes. Solomon Kane's like a lot grumpier, I would say, <laughs> than, than my character. Uh, but uh, you know, I mean, because he's got the religiosity that that exists. Mm-hmm. Um, I also don't think my character is a go it alone type of guy. Solomon Kane doesn't really ever uh make friends and have a cast of characters around him who he's hanging out with he always he always goes it alone and and that's uh that's that's a difference too yeah um the main the main reason i will admit that the main reason i br- i bring up some i bring up kane is the fact that while kane it kane was a cl- was a classical puritan he wasn't a, he he was as far removed from a preacher as what as one could get 
Yes, absolutely. And, and this is a this isn't a priest. It's a it's a knight, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's not he. It's not his job to. Tr- it's not his job to try and convert. It's his, it's his job to fight the to fight demon to fight demons and the people who are who might harm um his his uh, charge. Exactly. And I do th- I do think that's something that that's something that um is worth noting cuz I will level I will level with you on on one thing and I've I brought this up with the clan I think I brought this up with um with Dr. Bell and with you in the past I I cringe with a lot of religious fiction Yeah and and a lot of it is uh a lot of it is cringeworthy for sure And the big re- the big reason that I do it is is um as I as I said as I said to Finn one, once, they put the religious before the fiction. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and that's that's not a uh, and that's not just uh, common with religious fiction. I mean, that's that's the main problem with a lot of modern comics. Also, mm-hmm. um, I mean, if you look back again to like the Stan Lee stuff of the sixties and seventies, which I love to read, um, you know, sometimes they do have these messages. Sometimes they are trying to push different cultural things uh on people but you know what you know they're they're gonna have the x-men fight magneto first and that's gonna kind of be a subtext in there and it's just that's honestly it's just a matter of skill of writing rather than it is anybody's particular worldview yeah um the 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 analogy that i often use because because i'm a fan i'm a fan of um star trek after roddenberry is Janeway was written as the female captain. Cisco was not written as the black captain. Uh, correct. Yeah, Cisco was just a character. It didn't 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 matter. Um, Janeway wasn't. Janeway wasn't a few. I, I don't know. Janeway is the problem with. I'm a big Star Trek fan. Mm-hmm. Uh, for those who don't know, the real problem with Janeway was I don't know that she was written as the female captain in every episode, but she wasn't a few, and that was annoying, of course. But there was really no consistency for her character at all. She really no. just like was all over the map. Dep- one day or another, would would act totally different mm-hmm. uh, depending on the writer and depending on the episode. So it's it, they never really found her sweet spot uh, to where you could really care about her all that much. And that uh, that that was much the detriment of the show. Um, yeah. And uh, that that ended up really wrecking Voyager at the end of the day. But uh, yeah, that's that's what makes Cisco so great. Is you you can. You can hear Benjamin Sisko's voice. It's him. It's not a race. It's not a gender. It's it's his. It's just his voice, uh, and uh, and that's that's what makes a good character versus a bad character in any setting. I do find it funny that um that they that the producers didn't want to grow didn't want him to grow a beard because because apparently it would make him look scary. <laughs> yeah, that's uh. I mean, there's silly things like that, yeah. but yeah. but the. I'd, given what you mentioned about about Janeway, that does str- that does stress the importance of what I've. Now I I didn't come up with this term, but I've um I've incorporated it because I've used it a lot, and that's the concept of a series bible. Um, I didn't come yes. up with the term. I it's it's a term I've seen get thrown around in television production for years. It's basically some sort of book or some sort of document that ha- that is that that lists. Okay, these are the important plot points. These are the important characters. These are these are the relationships that we need, and we need to stick to as much of this as we possibly can. And if we have to break it, we have to give a good reason why. Um. Obviously, that's the short short version of it, but the but the overall the overall point is is that there needs to you need to have a set of rules established before you can start bending or breaking them. With yes. Deus Vold, even before you started writing, did you did you have something like that in mind? Yeah, I, m- I mentioned my my sort of mm-hmm. seven realms and all that, uh, yeah. so that exists. Uh, I've got I've 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 obviously established through that that God, angels, demons are real, um, and so we're operating through that realm. Um, the realms are going to each have kind of different rules to them. Th- those exist. Um, you know the kitten are going to be like they are uh, they're going to be a little more playful they're going to be a little more uh they're energetic sometimes they're lazy other times you know kind of like cats right and uh and our knight's going to be a very a very strong male lead 
stalwart knight because I, I I wanted to just I want to show that character again. You just haven't seen that in a lot of mm-hmm. decades. I feel like. Yeah, and when now when it come given given all of that when it the other thing I'm curious about is some is the differences with environment. Now, obviously, we're not dealing with gra- with gravity differences because. Um, that because that pro- that'd probably kill him or wi- or wish that it did. I mean, hell, right. hell, hell when people when people are going from just the moon to just from space to Earth, they have to they have to spend time getting acclimated to regular gravity again. But what when it comes to some, when it comes to some of the natural phenomena that could be a threat, um, are there any are there any things that are unique to this setting? When it come, when it come, whether it be bizarre, whether it be bizarre weather or something like that. Uh, yeah. I mean, there's there's some ways that magic kind of twists the fabric of reality, which mm-hmm. we start to see, especially towards the end of the book, as he gets closer and closer to the demon's layer specifically. Uh, you know, the demon is more in control of things than uh, than uh, I'd say God's creation is. So it becomes less like uh, a normal ground you're walking on I, I guess that's about all i'll say about that because <laughs> otherwise it's kind of spoilery yeah and i'm i'm not gonna i'm not if i want to if i want to spoil something i'll spoil something that's already rotten and this doesn't apply sounds good but the the other th- obviously one of the big things that i noticed is the is the um color palette is the color palette and it's um it's not quite old for color, but it is using a far it is using a far more restricted amount of color than you than you typically see. Was, yeah, I actually what, went with a normal color palette at first, and my artist balked at it. So uh, he he's like, "No, I don't want to do that with this book," and he wanted to restrict it, uh, much like the '70s and '80s book. Mm-hmm. If you look at a, especially European comics from the the late '70s and early '80s. Uh, it's almost a dead ringer for those. So you, you can look. Uh, I'm reading uh, Jeremiah by Herman right mm-hmm. now, which is a, which is a uh, post-apocalyptic uh, late '70s book, and the colors are very very similar to that. So we just wanted to evoke that kind of feel because uh, you know there's a lot of cool comics uh, in that that are like that, and it just evokes a classic immersion to it. Yeah, and when it can, I I um. I will fr- I will freely admit that when I look at a lot of, when I look at a lot of the images, um, I end up having my own little internal soundtrack go- going on with a lot of them, and part of that is due to the fact that I listen to a lot of music. I'm not I'm not going to deny that fact, but were but were there certain musical cues that you had that you had in the back of your mind when it came to designing certain scenes? Um, for this, not really. I mean, I've just gone into, uh, I, li- I just like, while I write and while I edit now, I just listen to lo-fi, uh, that lo-fi hip hop radio at this point, <laughs> um, cause it just drones in the background and then I don't have to think. Um, and then, uh, and then everything, uh, I do from there is just n- my own and it doesn't really do anything. I used to, I used to listen to different things just depending. I used to, there used to be like, I used to listen to metal when I was doing fight scenes and, um, you know, some ambient music and uh, during different times. And, uh, I, I, but I, I just switched that. I don't know, just because, uh, I, I didn't really intend on it. It just, uh, just happened one day. <laughs> and the other, the, the other thing I find, I find, I find kind of, amu- kind of amusing is the fact that the, um, the the um cover the cover that Je- that Jesse White did um what well, what with the use what well, with using the the sword and the axe as now first off I could I easily see that as the, as one giant send up to Conan but I'm guessing that the approach that the approach that you have when it comes to Sir Domingo is you're not doing the whole you're not doing the whole only using a sword kind kind of attitude. His approach is to use any sort of weapon he can get his hands on. 
Yeah, uh, that that's definitely uh, he, he's an objective oriented person. So he will just he will whatever gets him there is what gets him there. Um, now he's uh, his sword has special code, which we'll see in the book too. Uh, but uh, but beyond that, uh, if if he didn't have it, he definitely uh, would would use whatever's around. Yeah. Now. The look that I've seen so far seems to lean a little bit more in the realm of sword and sorcery compared to um, high fantasy. That's the goal. Yep. Yeah. Which, which I do. Which I will give you your props for un for understanding the difference because a lot of people get those two confused or think that th or think that sword and sorcery is just enough is just high fantasy with less steps. Yeah, it's a. Uh... It, there, it's a, I don't know. I feel like high fantasy is more focused on setting, and sword and sorcery is more focused on action. It, it, as the as the rule, you know. The the interpretation I've always stuck with when it comes to sword and sorcery is that these are, is that these are you ha is you have. Char you have characters who are o who are o who are overcoming insurmountable obstacles with nothing but pure wits, luck, and, for lack of a better term, gumption. Like, um, I could see that. Uh, there's a there's a travel element to sword and sorcery quite a bit too. Yeah. Um, and I guess high fantasy. I guess Robert Jordan really did delve into traveling around the world, and so does. So does Lord of the Rings, well, but uh, but it, it feels a little more like um, their their travels in those feel like a like we're going to do this mission then go back home, mm -hmm. uh, and Sword and Sorcery feels like we're we're wandering nomadically almost. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Um, so it's it that I guess it's kind of splitting hairs, but it is mm -hmm. definitely a different vibe. Yeah, I uh, I'm all about specificity, so I so I can I kind of am compelled to split hairs when it comes to this sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but part of but part of the reason I bring that up is when you look at a lot of when you look at a lot of settlements with sword and sorcery, especially with um especially with the likes of Conan or Cull, you ha you have a lot of um village level set settlements, but n but very little in the way of nations is represented right. even even when there are nations yeah is, it's like a, it's a city state thing mm -hmm. going down is mm -hmm. that represented in deus vault yeah we don't really we don't see much of this realm beyond the kitian and some open area and uh and like the demons kind of realm mm -hmm. uh so we're limited to what we see just because this is pretty it's a short story i mean it's 66 pages of a comic right yeah um but uh yeah i did i didn't get into any nations or, or kings or anything like that it's uh you know he he does his thing in in the in the city they're in and goes outside and fights his battles and that's mm -hmm. about it mm -hmm. and i'm guess i'm guessing oh the other thing is that a lot of a lot of sword and a lot of um sword and sorcery has a very um a very f often has a very fertile crescent look to how look to how it goes is that the kind of environment that he that that he that um that we're in with Ki with Kithian or is or is it more temperate um it feels a little harsher of environment than i i'd say it's on the harsh side yeah there's not I, there's not a ton of weather in the book, um, just because again it's just a short period of time that we see. But uh, there's there's definitely an evocative feel where like it's kind of a dry mm -hmm. land for the most part, um, and uh, that that's that kind that yeah. kind of leans into what I what I meant by the fer by the um, fertile crescent region. Yeah, I don't know. Is obvious. Because with that kind of region, you you mostly have um, areas like no like northern Africa and right. and the middle and the Middle East. Yeah, and I guess we're trying to evoke that a little bit just because this is a crusade and the Holy Land sort of theme, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Now, 
when, now when it comes to when it comes to the book the book it's the book itself um like you're you're do you're doing um you're doing a standard cover a a and a variant cover when it comes mm -hmm. to the trade paperback um now what is now um it given the fact that this is that you said that you're using the same printer that you use for the, your novels is mm -hmm. Is that going to significantly affect the the um, printing process? No, like, it's, it... I, this, this is the exact same process I've done with every single book so far. Okay. Um, I, I always have one cover, I always have a variant cover, and I always have a hardcover version mm -hmm. of the main cover. Yeah. And so it's just, I've just, is there a reason for it? Um, I mean, I like having the hardcover option uh, because I like to collect hardcovers. Um, I, I like having a variant option so somebody can have something a little more exclusive because those never get sold after the campaign. And I like having a less expensive option so people can just get in on the book, and that's the one that's just always going to be out there. Yeah. So uh, I, I don't, I don't want to go crazy beyond that. I thought about testing the waters because I've seen a lot of Kickstarter campaigns and all that do really well when you have like four or five variant covers, and then you sell packages of all of them together. Um, but, you know, I, I was just like, yeah, I just, I just... I'd rather spend the time writing another story and creating another story than uh, formatting five covers, <laughs> and, right? So, uh, so that's kind of uh, that's kind of why we limited it to one. Besides, it's not the '90s anymore. <laughs> it sells really. It, you, you say that, but it, it definitely on Kickstarters that are very successful. It definitely is. Uh, definitely, people buy those variant covers mm -hmm. constantly. So. Yeah. Um. Now I I realize that it's definitely going to be in, definitely going to be in flux, especially given especially given the possibility of stretch goals. But what but what would you be shooting for as far as the digital release date? I I know that um the physical version is going to is going to take a whole lot longer because well printing takes a while and yeah there's all the st all the complications with the coof and and international shipping. We're trying to, um, we're almost done. So, uh, I mean, beyond the stretch goals, uh, the stretch goals are going to be all that we can add in. So I'll be able to deliver, uh, the book without the stretch goals pretty much quickly. The only thing that we've left is we've left three pages cause there's a tier on there where you can get drawn into the book. Um, and so we are uh, making sure that we can do that, uh, before we, and, and get, get those all drawn before, um, you know, obviously before. Uh, we can wrap all that up. So that, that's the only thing that's going to hold anything up in the process. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is the first time I've actually tried. Well, now I tried it on Flying Sparks once, um, but I, but I did it weird on Flying Sparks because like I was selling it for volume. I think uh, it was with volume three, and I already had volume four drawn, and so I couldn't even do it for volume four. So I had to go on the campaign and said it'll appear in volume five which is a long ways out for people to want to pack something. So I didn't get a, a ton of backers on that. Uh, but this one, we're almost we're almost out of spots for it. So uh, people are really into that uh, when you can actually get it drawn in the actual book. So I might I might, uh, might add that in to all my campaigns going forward. Mm -hmm. And now I, I realize that I realize that you left a few left a few pages that there, there, but um something that i'm cu i'm curious if if um with this 66 page story if you're planning on doing it as one continuous thing or are you planning on breaking it into um chapters within within um, the page by this page this broken into chapters in the beginning of it. so i do ev i do everything comic wise like that so um i like having issues of comics mm -hmm. um so and i like the the uh, the ability to re-release them as single issues too if i feel like it so I write I write to twenty two page issues just because I I just can't break that habit uh, of floppy comics like you, I used to have uh, back in the day. Mm -hmm. and so there's three individual issues to this, uh, and they each kind of have their own story elements to it. But uh, but this is Dave's Vol more than my other books is really just one complete story. This is you know I I wasn't sure if we were going to do another one. I wasn't sure if this was going to be a franchise or even how well it would do just because. Uh, you mentioned, you know, an aversion to to some religious books at the beginning. You never know, like, if that's going to turn people off or, or how a book's going to do. 
So this is this is really set as one story, uh, but but each part really has its own beginning, middle, end climax to it uh, in the chapters also. All right, I get I can I can definitely get be, I can definitely get behind that. Um, and I will I will this is and given the given um. Now, when now when it comes to the other two involved in the trio developing it, obvious, obviously, um, colorist Matt Crotz is some, is somebody I've been somebody I'm familiar with because well he's visited that he's visited these hallowed halls in the past. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but how did you how did you get in touch with um, Jesse White? Um, I have known Jesse for a couple years. We just kind of run in the same circles, um, and so uh, we. Uh, just had talked for a bit. I saw some of his art, and I'm like, "Hey, do you want to do a book together at some point?" You know, he's like, "Yeah," and you never know because I I ask, you know, dozens of artists that. <laughs> um, and then at some point, uh, and I what happens is when somebody comes back, um, and is like, um, I really want to uh, do this, and they actually message take their time to message me later. I, I go, "Oh, this person's serious." Uh, so then I start talking with them, and then so I see if it'll work out. And uh, my usual artist process uh, is I'm very scared uh, because I don't want to start a graphic novel of 66 pages, have somebody get in eight pages, and then cancel, uh, which I've had happen before. A lot of people have this happen. You see a lot of independent books switch up artists and things like that. It's, re- it's really painful for storylines. I don't want to deal with that at this point in my career. <laughs> so I'm, I'm very frank with people. I'm like, you have to stick this out. This is a big commitment. Uh, if you've never done anything like this before, this is not an easy thing. You're going to, you're not going to be all jazzed and excited about this after, you know, page 12, right? Cause mm-hmm. artists take a long time on these things. Oh, yeah. um, and Jesse was committed. So, uh, so I got him going, I uh, got him going on the first, I wrote out the first issue and you know th- that's the next thing I do is it's like oh if I've got that first issue, uh, I could always just sell that first issue if things go wrong and then not bother, right? Um, and so I worked with that 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 got done and Jesse just kept cranking it out, and uh, it turns out you know he's a consummate professional, one of the best out there that I've ever worked with, mm-hmm. um, and uh, I'm it's just a happy 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 experience. Uh, I would uh, I I would love to work with Jesse just full time. It's awesome. Oh. And um, I do, I do get a, I will admit, I got a kick out of the fact that the original um, coloring you you uh, sent you sent to Jesse was ju- was just completely balked. Um, yes. <laughs> so, am I am I right in this in the sense that the the whole idea of make of making it look like a seventies or seventies or eighties comic was hit was Jesse's idea? Uh, I wanted that vibe uh, going in. Um, for sure, but uh, uh, and I of course his uh, of course his lines kind of lend towards that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yes, he was. Uh, but he he pushed the colors in that direction for sure. Um, and then once I saw, I like I did. I wasn't even sure what he was going for at first um, because like I'm just like, all oh, digital colors are digital colors. Your lines look great. It's not going to matter what the colors are. That's, that was my thought on it, um, and uh, I'm, you know, he uh, he had uh, he had his deal in mind, and it worked out really well. So mm-hmm. I'm uh, I'm actually investigating switching up vibe of a lot of my comics towards this because I I do like this style better now that I've seen it, but I had to see it to believe it, right? Mm-hmm. Well, see, well, seeing as well as far as seeing is believing, I can say I can certainly say I'm I'm a be- I'm a believer. And, nice, any, yeah. and anyone Beautiful. who anyone who breaks out that anyone who breaks out a certain song after hearing that um, <laughs> will be will be sent to the flogging chamber. Nice, because the punishment should fit the crime. But with that with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule and braving the hell of time zones to come all the way up to the temple. Sure thing, happy to. And, and anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Awesome. 
And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!